Today we're going to be talking about the endocannabinoid system. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, graduated from UMKC in 2015. Started at St. Joseph immediately after that. Received my board certification as a geriatric pharmacist this past year. And in 2016, the UMKC School of Pharmacy started offering an intro to cannabis medicine class. And I've been fortunate enough to offer uh, six different lectures over the past three years in, in that class. <laughs> and so I have a few objectives for you today. We're going to talk about the endocannabinoid system, what the players are in that system, what it does, what its role is. We're going to talk a little bit about clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, which is an ongoing theory. And then we're going to end talking about the pharmacist's potential role in, in cannabis-based medicine. So a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. It's one of the largest systems in the body, and it's very important, and there's a couple reasons why. So the endocannabinoid system has been around for 500 million years. So it's a very, very old system. 500 years ago, there weren't any humans, there weren't any plants. The most organized, um, the most advanced organism was a sponge at that time. So if, if it wasn't important, it wouldn't have continued on through evolution throughout that time. Does anybody know how long humans have, have been around? About, any guesses? Maybe two, five million years, depending on, on the species. So 500 million years compared to, to five million is, is a long time to have this system. And another reason I know it's important is that all vertebrates have the, the system. Anything with the spine, from humans to fish, there are certain fungi that, that have the endocannabinoid system, different truffles have it, so it's a very, um, very prominent system in all animals and, and well throughout the body. So it's made up of, of three different components. You have the cannabinoid receptors, you have the endogenous cannabinoids or the endocannabinoids, and then you have regulatory enzymes that, that affect all of, those, all of those players. And what's, what's important about the endocannabinoid system, as Kristen said, is that it's a regulatory system. So essentially, if your body's too hot, it cools it down. If it's too cool, it warms it up. It keeps everything at homeostasis and keeps everything where it needs to be. And since the system's found so wide in the body, it affects a number of different, different organs and different processes. It's, it's important in memory. Uh, cannabis can help people forget. It's, people think it's important to remember stuff. It's also important to forget stuff. Um, if you're on a, an airplane, you don't want to remember every single person's face on that airplane. It's not advantageous to you as a, as a human to, to go through that or to, to use up your energy to do that. So forgetting is, is important. Um, definitely affects your mood, the brain reward systems. So one, one reason that they think cannabis has been around for humans for so long, they've done studies and they have people taste high fat foods. They don't, they don't swallow it, they just taste it. And then after tasting those foods, they measured their endocannabinoid levels in the gut and those increased. Um, so this, this makes sense. You eat a high fatty food, your endocannabinoids increase in your body, it makes you feel good. So you're gonna eat more high fat foods. And nowadays that's not so advantageous, but early on when food was scarce, it, it was beneficial to, to have high fatty foods. So there are three types of cannabinoids that we're gonna talk about. The endocannabinoids, which are endogenous can cannabinoids. Um, so this means that our body makes them. They're phytocannabinoids. Phyto is Greek for plant. So these are cannabinoids that plants make. And then there are synthetic cannabinoids. And what I'm referring to there are products like K2 and spice um, and things like that. Okay, so on to endocannabinoids. Most neurotransmitters, your body already has them, they're stored, and then when you need them, they're released. Endocannabinoids are different in that they're made as needed, so they're made by your body on demand. If you need an endocannabinoid, it's gonna make it right then and use it. So by definition, endocannabinoids bind to cannabinoid receptors. There are two main endocannabinoids. There's anandamide, which is Sanskrit for bliss, 
It's kind of a, a unique, nice name. And then there's 2-AG, which is 2-arachidonal glycerol. And these, these are, like I said, these are things that your body makes. And since your body makes them, uh, you're likely to have a receptor that, that they bind to, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and I would just mention that uh, 2-AG binds very strongly to the CB1 and CB2 receptor, which is going to be analogous to, to THC as, as we'll get, get on a little bit later. Where anandamide binds very weakly to the CB1 receptor and very minimally to the CB2 receptor. And it actually has some, some effects at what's called the TRPV1 receptor. Okay, so phytocannabinoids, this is our THC and our CBD and uh, the cannabinoids that the plants make. Does anybody know why plants make cannabinoids? It's not, it's not to, to benefit us. Plants have been around a lot longer. You're, yeah, yes, um, indir indirectly. So one, one of the benefits to the cannab cannabinoids that the plants make is that it protects it from UV rays. What UV rays do is they, they get into your DNA, they cause damage, and if you have damaged DNA, you're not able to reproduce as well. So, that, so that's part of it. Um, cannabinoids also act as insecticides. They can be bactericidal. Um, so that, that keeps all the, all the bugs away. And even just the stickiness of, of cannab cannabinoids can, can keep bugs away because they get trapped in it, they don't like it, they stay away from it. You say bugs, you can Pardon? Insects. insects. Oh, yeah, yeah. So insects try to attack cannabis, and they don't like it because that has all these cannabinoids on it. So that helps the plant reproduce and, and further propagate. Yep. Over 100 known uh, phytocannabinoids. The two main ones, like I said, are THC and CBD. THC um, kind of maxes out at about 25% of the plant weight, uh, where CBD is often less so. Most of the other cannabinoids are produced in very, very small uh, quantities. A couple other uh, cannabinoids I wanted to, to mention. There's THCV, which is shown to, to affect appetite. It might be useful in weight loss. And, and these are things drug companies are, are looking at currently. CBC, which is cannabichromine, as well as CBG, which is cannabigerol. These have shown, um, not, not in human studies, but anti-tumor effects as well as analgesic effects, anti-inflammatory effects. So there's the potential uh, for pain, pain management with those. Synthetic cannabinoids, that's our, our K2, our spice. In 2015, the DEA banned 15 different uh, synthetic cannabinoids. But what, what happened was, even though they banned those chemicals, these drug companies, they make they make them a little bit different. So it's not the same molecule, it's a little bit different. And since it's a little bit different, it's not illegal anymore. So they're able to sell it, um, which, is, which is unfortunate. Um, the, and they act like THC, they bind to the CBD1 receptor, they produce those same results that, that THC would, but, but it's, it's different. Sometimes they bind too hard to the receptor and it causes unknown effects. Um, these chemicals haven't been around very long where cannabis has been around for a very long time. So we don't know the long-term effects. And there have been a number of case reports. So I'd, I'd like to say that, that drugs are well-regulated. People test those. Uh, food's well-regulated. People watch you know, what, what they're eating as far as federal regulation. Vitamin supplements are not very well-regulated. I could put sand in an empty capsule and sell it as Michael's special vitamin, and, and nobody would be the wiser until somebody started complaining about it. So that it's not, uh, nobody's, nobody's following up on these. A uh, number of case reports uh, have shown that these chemicals can potentially contribute to heart attacks, um, contribute to seizures, anxiety, tremors. This past weekend in Illinois, there were over 38 people hospitalized for using these. Um, they had severe bleeding, one patient bled to death. Um, and what, what happened was is that they tested these patients and they had rat poison in them. Uh, there were three of them that, that showed up having rat poison. So like I said, it's not regulated. You don't know what you're getting. Um, so why would anybody use K2 or spice or a synthetic cannabinoid? Drug test. Drug test, that's right, that's right. So that's, that's kind of a, a bad solution to a bad problem. Um, these, when you take THC, it gets metabolized uh, to another molecule 
And that other molecule stays in your body for a very, very long time. So when they drug test you even, you know, weeks, a month after you've used, it'll, it'll show up where these, uh, these synthetic cannabinoids don't have that metabolite, so it doesn't show up on the drug test. So there are two main cannabinoid receptors. There's the CB1 and the CB2 receptor. The CB1 receptor, so, so what, what I want you to think about this is where the receptor located will help tell you what it does. So the CB1 receptor is located in the central nervous system, which is your brain. So anything that binds to the CB1 receptor is going to affect things that, that are in your brain. So like mood, um, appetite, sleepiness. And this makes sense because THC binds to the CB1 receptor and causes these effects. The CB2 receptor is located mainly in immune cells. So this provides a mechanism to why cannabis is potentially good for autoimmune diseases. It binds to the immune cells and it causes it to act normal. It regulates it. CB2 receptors are also uh, involved in anti-inflammatory things, so that's why cannabis can potentially help with pain for, for a number of patients. There are a couple other receptors that are, are less well known. There's the TERP-V1 receptor, which also has a, plays a role in pain management. And then there's the GPR-55 receptor, which might eventually be the CB3 receptor, but it's something that, that um, time, will, time will tell. So one thing that I, I wanted to mention earlier is that CBD doesn't bind to any of these receptors. It works a little bit differently. Um, and we're gonna talk about that on the next slide. So one of CBD's main mechanisms of action is that it inhibits this fatty acid amide hydrolase, or FA. So FA breaks down an andamide, which we just said is an endocannabinoid that your body makes. So the more an andamide you have, you know, the potentially the better you feel. So, it, if fatty a, so what fatty acid amide hydrolase does is it breaks down the an andamide. So if CBD inhibits the molecule that's breaking down an andamide, you're going to have higher levels of an andamide. So that's part of how CBD works. It doesn't bind directly to those receptors. It just works um, kind of indirectly. And uh, monoacylglycerol lipase, it breaks down 2-AG. So you see words like fatty acid and lipase. We think of lipids and fats, and, and we know that cannabinoids are very lipophilic. They're very fatty substances. If you tried to dissolve it in water, you would have a lot of trouble. Um, it wouldn't work. Okay, so I don't know if you guys know this, but at your pharmacy there are a few cannabis-based medicine products that, that they might have. Uh, there's Nabilone, which the brand name is Sesamet, Dronabinol, Marinol, and then there's a brand new Dronabinol oral solution called Syndros is the, the brand name. Are any of you guys familiar with these? No. Okay. Are they CBD or THC? Good, good. So the, all three of those are THC analogs. So they act very similarly to THC. Do they have a report effect? It can, yep, yep. Um, and a lot of people don't, don't like that, um, that effect that, that happens with it. Are they actually derived from THC or are they synthetic? Good, good. Um, so dronabinol is... is um, it's more, so it's, it's a little nuanced. The generic is derived from, from THC where the, the brand name is actually manufactured. Um, but Nabilone is, is an analog that's, that's synthetically made. Yep, and, and pe people don't like these. People like the entourage effect where you have, um, these are a little too strong for people and, and they, they don't seem to, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys know anybody that's on them, so. Well, they prescribe them for it too. Good, good, so they're FDA approved, and uh, Sesame, the Nabilone, has one FDA approved indication for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, which the Dronabinol products do as well, but they have an additional indication for uh, um, HIV wasting syndrome, AIDS wasting syndrome, and that makes sense because it's gonna increase their appetite and you know, let them eat more. I've got one photo. Yeah. Uh, all time. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it, it filled up the blood and all that. It took a while. You know, about four or five days for all the blood to come out of the 
Okay. So, is that was that a direct extract from what we're talking about these days? Number one. Number two. When you're talking about the rest of the system, is it? You know, I've gotten this far into it, but is it is it kind of like a free radical? The way it works, to where it goes out, just is it a DNA, DNA changing or inhibitor, where you know the bad things you put in your body and changing your DNA structure of the cell, where it's what you're talking about with with, with cannabis, mm -hmm. it blocks a lot of the things that can go in and cause you to get cancer or get a lot of different other things. That's the other thing. Sure. So, so cancer happens when when your body's kind of out of out of whack. So your 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 cells start reproducing at an unreasonable rate. So can't uh, different and certain certain cannabinoids might might help with that. Um, your first your first question. I'm not I'm not sure what what product that might have been. That's not something I'm familiar with. Uh, THC has been shown to decrease intraocular pressure. Uh, that's why it's used for glaucoma. So I'm not. That, that might have been related to that. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we talked about drug testing a little bit earlier. If if you can talk your doctor into prescribing this to you, and you show it, it it's going to make your drug test show positive, but you'll have the proof that you're on this medication. That's going to show. Um, so you, you you shouldn't be discriminated against from your, from your employer. So the, the pharmaceutical companies that make this, they spend a lot of money doing research, they, they spend a lot of money on advertising, so that, that translates into patients paying a lot of money for these therapies. Uh, the the Navalone cost over $2,000 for a month's supply, just cash price. Uh, Dronabinol is about $500, and then the oral solution is about $1,000, and it's, it's, it's dependent on the dose and things like that, but it's, that's not cheap for a month's supply of, of medication. And the Sativex, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, um, that's another one that's about $1,000. And that's not approved in the US, so it's not FDA approved, but it's improved in many countries in Europe and as well as uh, Canada. So there, the Syndros is a new product, and the company that makes that is Incess, um, Incess Therapeutics. And has anybody ever heard of, heard of them or know what product that? Yeah. INSYS. Yeah, yeah, it sounds yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> I try to enunciate when I say it. So they made a, a sublingual fentanyl spray, and they had very, so fentanyl is a, a very potent op opioid, one of the most potent opioids, and they, they made a spray, and it's only FDA approved for, for end stage cancer, so people that are dying is, is what, is, are the people that need this medication, but they're, they're very aggressive marketing. Uh, they, they were trying to get it approved for, for conditions that, that weren't end-stage cancer. So they, they were really pushing opioids and, and potentially contributed to the opioid crisis. Somebody just overdosed that spray. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. Um, so the, the same company that, that makes that and that pushed that so hard is now making a cannabis product, and, and that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Especially when they're charging patients two thousand dollars to to use it. It would be very similar to to taking just so it's just THC. So usually when you're getting an edible or you're smoking something, there's other stuff in it. So it's it's not quite the quite the same. Um, it's not necessarily toxic, toxic by any means. It's still fairly um, well tolerated. It has a high, what we call, uh, therapeutic index. So the, you can do a big dose and it's not gonna hurt you. You can do a little dose and, it, and it's probably gonna be okay. So there's a pretty big window there. So the, Acomplia, Romanabant, is a drug that pharmaceutical companies came out to help with weight loss. The theory behind it was THC binds to the CB1 receptor and it makes people hungry. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna block the CB1 receptor, make them not hungry, and then they're gonna lose weight. Makes sense, right? What happened was, so we also know that THC binds to CBD receptor, um, the CB1 receptor, excuse me, and that it makes you feel happy, it makes you feel good, it, it produces, you know, anandamide means bliss, you know, we just talked about that. 
So if you're blocking that, what do you think is going to happen? Get yeah, these people got really depressed. They lost weight, but they were depressed. And there was even an increased risk of suicide in these patients. And they eat because they're depressed. <laughs> yeah, and that could have happened too. But I mean, the severe depression, increased risk of suicide, so they took it off the market. It was never approved in the, in the US, but they did use it in, in Europe a little bit. So we're going to talk about Sativex. This is a one-to-one -one THC CBD spray. So you are getting, and it, and it is, does come from the whole plant, so you're getting a, potentially a little bit more um, of that entourage effect. And this is indicated for spasticity associated with MS. Um, so it's really good for, for MS patients, multiple sclerosis. And like I said, it's approved all over Europe. It's approved in Canada. I, I wouldn't be too surprised to see it FDA approved before too long. Um, but again, it is, it is very costly. What was that? Um, and it has a couple different names, uh, Nabixamols, but it's essentially a, a THC to CBD spray. And the same company that makes this Sativex makes this Apedialex medication, and that's GW Pharma. And Apedialex is CBD, and there's, there's good evidence, and what they're marketing it for is pediatric epilepsy, and in particular, refractory epilepsy. So the, these are our, the, so things like Dravet syndrome, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, these patients are having many seizures a day. Charlotte Figgy had Dravet syndrome and CBD seemed to, to work for her, for her. And they've done clinical trials with this and CBD does seem to, to work for a good percentage of patients. There are some that it can make it worse. Um, there are some that it doesn't affect, but there's a, there's a good percentage of patients that, that it seems to help for. So that's, that's another drug that I, I expect to see FDA approved um, in the near future. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. And this is a theory right now. And, and the theory is, is that some people are just innately, they don't have enough cannabinoids. Um, just like pe some people with depression, they don't have enough serotonin. People with Parkinson's disease, they don't have enough dopamine. People with Alzheimer's, they don't have enough acetylcholine. So it makes sense that if you don't have enough of something, if you give it more, it keeps their body normal. Um, so the greatest evidence is for migraines, fibromyalgia, and IBD, uh, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. And there's a lot of, a lot of overlap with, with these diseases. All of them cause, cause a lot of pain for patients. They're very chronic conditions. You can't, you can't draw a lab and, and say somebody has a migraine. And, and you can't do that for fibromyalgia either. So it's kind of a, so these patients are discriminated against often. They think it's like a psychosomatic thing where they, they, they think that these things are going on. And that's, that's because they're not able to, to draw a lab and test it. So there are a number of other conditions that, that they think this might happen in as well, like MS, PTSD, and it, and it might be the sole cause of the, the disease, but it can definitely contribute. And it makes sense that people with these diseases, when they get cannabis, they feel better. So that, that also adds to the evidence that, that they might be deficient in endocannabinoids. See, have they ever done a study compared to taking synthetic or whatever it is, mm -hmm. pharmaceutical? Just having a roll of doobie. Yeah, yeah, people like the doobie way better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people don't like the synthetic. It's, it's, yeah. So I, I didn't mention, but they're a controlled substance. It's not a C1 where nobody can get it. It's um, Dronabinol is a, a Schedule 3. So you have to have, um, you know, you can only get a six month set supply. You have to have the doctor's DEA number on there. There are certain regulations, but, but people don't abuse these. You don't see people selling Dronabinol on, on the street where, where benzos and, and opioids are, are very prominent. So when you say clinics, does mm -hmm. that mean, you know, like fibromyalgia, you know, right, you know, figure out mm -hmm. this is the cause. But how do you measure success? You know what I mean? If you don't know what causes it, how do you measure the success of the result, right? Yeah, yeah, there, and there are different ways you can do, you can ask the patient if they feel better, and if they say yes, maybe you, you count that as a success. And maybe if ev everybody says yes, that's even, even stronger evidence. So there, there are surveys, there are, there are few, it depends on the disease state, but there are ways to measure if, if patients are feeling better. And um, usually they'll use the same test that, that they do for other medications, but they'll just use cannabis as the drug instead of other meds. Oh, so the, 
migraine has the best, the best evidence for this deficiency. They had, it's a very small study, I think it was six patients with chronic migraines, six patients that don't have migraines, and they tested their anandamide levels, their, their AEA levels in their spinal cord, and there was a statistically significant difference in the levels. The patients that had migraines had less anandamide, and the patients that didn't have migraines had, had a normal amount. So that, that also provides a little bit of evidence for, for this theory. Okay, and I'm just gonna end by advocating for, for pharmacist involvement in, in cannabis-based medicine. There are currently six states that have legislation requiring pharmacists to be involved in, in medical cannabis. The bolded states are states that currently have programs. Connecticut's been going since 2012. And Connecticut's unique in that it's the only state on this list in which patients can use smokable cannabis. Um, so that, that's unfortunate that in Minnesota, New York, and Pennsylvania, um, patients aren't able to utilize that. And, and like, smokable cannabis isn't as expensive as, as other forms because there's less processing, there's less, less things that go on with it. Um, so it's, it's costly for these patients and if they can get something on the street that's less expensive, works better for them, they're not gonna utilize these medical programs very, very much. Arkansas and Louisiana are relatively new programs, they're not up and running yet. Pennsylvania says you can have a pharmacist on staff or you can have a physician, so it's kind of an either or. Um, it's not something that is exclusive to the pharmacist. So the pharmacists, we're, we're the drug experts. We know, we know the drugs. Um, if you go to a bud tender and ask them about pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data, they're, they're not gonna know what you're talking about. Um, there, there are drug interactions that, that happen with, with THC and CBD. There, there are well-established well interactions with CBD and uh, Clobazam, which is uh, another anticonvulsant, so it helps, helps pediatric patients with seizures. Um, so they, they, they both work in the liver, and they're kind of competing against each other. So the, if you're taking CBD and uh, Clobazam at the same time, you're not gonna have as much Clobazam. It's gonna get metabolized faster. There are also drug interactions that are just related to smoking. You guys, you guys ever hear about this? Coffee is one that, that's pretty prominent. So whenever you smoke, you get, the smoke contains hydrocarbons, and it causes your liver to increase metabolism of, a CYP, uh, of an enzyme that's called CYP1A2. So it increases your metabolism, you get rid of drugs faster. Caffeine is metabolized by 1A2. So if you smoke, you smoke two packs a day, um, you drink a cup of coffee, your body's gonna get rid of it faster than somebody that doesn't smoke. So essentially, if you have somebody that drinks, if you have somebody that drinks a lot of coffee and they're a huge smoker and all of a sudden they stop smoking, they can get maybe a little bit of caffeine toxicity, um, things like that. Um, and there are other medications, antidepressants, antipsychotics that, that are metabolized by CYP1 and 2. So just smoking can, can increase that and that's, that's there's the same amount of hydrocarbons in tobacco smoke and the same in cannabis smoke. Um, but if you're not smoking, you avoid the interaction at all. And, and these, are, these are things that, that people don't think about, that blood tenders don't think about, that physicians uh, don't necessarily think about. But this is, this is within our, our scope. And a, as a pharmacist, I deal with dangerous drugs every day. I deal with high-dose opioids, very potent uh, benzodiazepines. Um, these, these drugs are, are dangerous and and so to have cannabis as, as an option is, is something that, that's well, you know, well within my, my scope of practice. And what do you think the future is about what, on the federal level, so far as what every, you know, about like sessions and the method of opioid use? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a lot of politicians don't know the difference between so, between opioids and cannabis, yeah. they, they, they think everything's kind of yeah. under the same. It's all just, all That's, the same. yeah, yeah, and. I, I've seen some, a little bit here and there, where they're trying to explain that, but that's, that's the thing I did. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of data, and this is an, this is an unintended consequence of medical legalization, but it does show that people use less opioids overall in, in states that have legalized cannabis. They're, they're sort of substituting the, the opioids. Uh, they're using cannabis as a substitute for the opioids. So more studies, more articles, we're eliminating sessions. Yeah. It's going to take more time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Get the old time. 
yep. more education, more time. Um, it's you know we we have to to utilize evidence. We shouldn't we shouldn't do these things based on um, nonsense or emotions. So. All right, that's it. What, what other questions do you guys have? Do you feel like your approach to this is having pharmacists in all dispensaries? Yes, yes, that would that would kind of be an ideal world. I think I think recreational cannabis, adult use cannabis, that that's fine. Um, every, you know, I don't think that's that's something that we should fight too hard. Um, but I think if somebody wants to use it medicinally, just like any other drug that they're going to get, they should have. Um, there's what we call the triad. So there's the patient, the physician, and the pharmacist, and all three should be in agreement in order to have uh, an appropriate therapy. So does that change the dispensary method? Um, as far as? Do I have to go to the drugstore now to get it, or am I gonna, can I do it with the dispensary license? In, in my ideal world, or? You'd have a pharmacist. <laughs> yep, yep, you would have, have a pharmacist on staff. Yep, yep, and, and some people are gonna know what they want right away, but um, there, there are gonna be a number of patients that, that would definitely benefit from, from a pharmacist involvement. Is there a resource out there to look at different conditions and say quantities of CBD? Um, and the reason I ask that mm -hmm. is because, you know, you, you go buy a bottle, say CBD oil or a one to one oil in, in Colorado and have mm -hmm. one or two drops of the serving size, but you get on YouTube and you see, say, somebody with Parkinson's and that's shaking really bad, and then they take CBD, but it looks like they're taking probably three or four cc's mm -hmm. of CBD at one time. So how do you know where that balance is of yeah, dosing's, dosing's tough. Um, so I, I said that there are clinical trials for, for pediatric seizure patients. So we're, pretty, we're getting pretty good with, with dosing them, but other conditions, there's, there's not a lot of evidence. So it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, sort of one of the pharmacist mantras, start low and go slow. Start with a low dose and then gradually titrate up. And if you get too high, you, know, you can always go back, back down. Any other questions? What's you, need a, you need a job? I got a farm. I got a <laughs> store. I need a... Oh yeah, yep. Um, I'm very happy at the hospital on that right now. Um, but I, but I, but I, I love helping patients. So any, anything I can do would be would be a lot of fun. And what's more beneficial, a CBD with THC in it, like a one to one, or a CBD without THC in it, or is that? Too broad, of course. Yeah, and, and yeah, the answer is it depends. Um, um, I, I like people are scared of, of THC sometimes. They want the non psychoactive um, CBD. And, and to say CBD is not psychoactive is a little bit of a misnomer because it has antipsychotic properties. It can mitigate some of the, the effects that THC has. So THC causes that high. If you add some CBD to it, you get some of that less high. They say the optimal ratio is about 20 to 1 CBD to THC. So if you have 20, 20 milligrams of CBD and one milligram of THC, um, you're not gonna have that, those, that high feeling that, that people get with THC. That's kind of the magic number. And, and to get that entourage effect, I think pe people don't like the kind of the single, single chemical as much. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.